Good morning. I'm going to read our passage for us again this morning. This is Psalm 5, verses 1 through 3, and I'm reading it in the New King James. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. And now it is my privilege to introduce our speaker this morning, who needs no introduction for most of us, Ronnie. <laughs> I miss you guys. <laughs> never happens for me. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you guys for having me. I'm not going to use the mic because I think I talk loud enough, right? Okay. Um, uh, just to catch you up, I'm doing great. Our family is doing great. Uh, kids are crazy, um, as always, but it's fun. It's been a journey. Um, we've been, uh, I've been staying home on the weekends, watching the kids. My wife is actually helping out with the Friends Church in Corona, and she's been uh, a contract worship leader there. So for us, it's been kind of this, this crazy journey. I've been traveling for work um, and uh, still reading God's Word, studying Scripture, and uh, thinking through a lot of things and seeing a lot of different things around happening, following politics, and just wondering, okay, what, what's the future look like for the church? In fact, that's kind of why um, this morning I kind of thought this would be a cool experiment for us to do. I figured there's any, any place that I could do this, it would be at Box, right? So, why not do it here, right? And it was spurred on because of a couple of different things that happened over the past several weeks. Uh, first, I was with a friend, and we were just hanging out talking, and uh, he, he just started saying things about scripture that he just assumed were true and right and was making uh, these statements very, very clear about the world we live in and about what, what scripture says about these things. And maybe you've had these conversations with people who come across them very, very, very sure about what he was saying. And as I'm listening, I'm just thinking to myself, like, you missed basic Bible study 101, <laughs> things that you're, you're, you're pulling scripture from and saying things that aren't necessarily applicable. And so I'm like, wow, this is, this is astounding. I mean, whole worldviews are being created from um, his, his ways of thinking. And, I, and I, I didn't take time to correct, but I was just listening. Okay, okay. Then later on, I, I was online, and you know, I don't go online much for social media, but once in a while it's like a dumpster fire, right? You just go into a comment section or something, and you just watch. And it just like, the way that things just sort of cascade into this like terrible abyss, um, I watched somebody uh, pull verses to, you know, promote their ways, their views, which is, this is called proof texting, right? You take a text and you pull it out of its context, put it there and go, this is how it is. And, uh, and it's dangerous. And I'm watching people do this, having these dialogues, and I'm thinking to myself, this is, this is not, not a good thing, right? And, and I've seen this for a long time. Then I started thinking about church in my last 10, 12 years being a part of churches, and I've never sat in a room where I had anyone ever teach about how to maybe look at a text, how to read a text, how to understand a text. I went to Bible college where I learned that, but it seems interesting that when we gather people together in masses every week to talk about these, these texts, that we don't ever teach people how to read them, uh, how to like engage in the text, how to take from the text what, what, what it means. And, and a big thing that I think people don't understand, we're going to start with this first, is that, and I've said this before, so bear with me if you've heard this, is that the Bible was not written to us, right? Uh, for some people, maybe that's a new thought, but it wasn't written to us. This is, this is a collection of texts, um, ancient texts that were written to a specific group of people in a time, in a place, with very real things that were happening to them in that place. And so to, to, to remove that and bring it here without any um, thought to the original meaning is dangerous, right? That being said, it doesn't mean that the Bible is not for us. Um, there are lots of things, because if we take the Bible and we start from a very human standpoint, a very human perspective, there are major truths that we can draw from it, right? Because it's the human experience. And if you look at Scripture, you can see there's lots of things in, in the text that are happening today, right? Because we're human. We see a lot of the same patterns, the things that we end up doing. And so I think to that end, it's very important that we understand and we look at the text and know what it means for us today and how do we do that. So what happens typically in churches is you guys show up, and I'm speaking general, but you guys show up, and it's expected that the person who's on stage 
um, is the one who does all the heavy lifting, right? And, and what ends up happening, and it's not necessarily explicitly, although in some instances I think it's, ex it's explicitly happening, but I think in a lot of places it's unintentionally happening, is this consolidation of power. So the person on the stage is the one who holds all the truth about the Bible, so you come to me to hear from me what I have to say about this thing. And that's dangerous, because that's just my perspective on something, right? I've got my own biases, I've got my own culture, my own context that I come from. Which is why I think it's powerful that you hear women speakers, because women have a different perspective on the world, on life, and about how they experience things. And so how do we just take one perspective and lean on that only? And that's dangerous. So today I thought what we'd do is we'd take a text, and we would read it together. Um, you guys would spend some time reading it, and I'm going to walk you through uh, a way of engaging the text in your own time, in your own way, that, you, that might be helpful for you. Um, because I love you, because I care about you, because I'm so generous, <laughs> I put together the passage on a piece of paper, so if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. Um, so 1 John 3 is the one we're going to look at. I think it's front and back. Yeah, so this is the text that we're going to look at today. Now, if you have another piece of paper here, do not cheat. Do not cheat and start looking at this, okay? Because if you start cheating and looking at this, then you are the problem, right? <laughs> this is what happens. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to read this, and I'm going to kind of coach you. So think of this as like an interactive sort of classroom. Um, there are no wrong answers. We're all just going to shout out together. Don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel overwhelmed. Don't feel pressured to have an answer. If you want to sit and just listen, that's okay. But if you want to try to engage and ask questions, questions are better than answers, right? Because if a good question is asked, then it creates more and more questions, and we can dig deeper. So I want to allow time for that. So I'm not going to talk too much. Um, but what I've done is I've just printed this for you guys, and what we're going to do is we're going to read it. So I'm going to read it first, and then I'm going to give you a few minutes to read it by yourself with your pencil or pen. And I just want you to go through, and I want you to underline things that are noticeable. You're, what you're going to do is called observation. You're just going to observe the text. Now, hear me. This is not interpret the text. You're not interpreting text right now. You're just observing. So think of yourselves as, like, uh, journalists. You're on assignment. And your job is to literally observe a scenario, a situation, something that's happening, and you're just to take notes about what you see happening, okay? Don't worry about what's happening culturally. You don't know that yet. You, you don't have those information. I've got that for you coming. But I want to just see how we observe the text, what we see. So what you're looking for, you're looking for patterns, things that come up a lot. So if you see repetitive words, circle, underline those things. If you go, oh, I don't know what this means, write a question mark next to it, right? Or if something seems out of place, well, this is a weird thing. Why is he saying this in the midst of all these things? Question mark, circle, underline, right? So um, those are the kinds of things you're going to look for. I'm going to read it, and I'm going to give you a chance, and then we're going to talk and discuss, and then we're going to move on in the process. Sound good? Okay. First John chapter 3. See how very much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is, and all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as they are pure. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning, because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning, because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God, and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously, and does not love other believers, does not belong to God. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So do not be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, 
It proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life within them. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence, and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey and do the things that please him. And this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him and he with them. And we know he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. Okay. So, take a few minutes. Just skim through it as you were listening. I'm sure there were words that were repeating over and over again. Love should be one of those words, right? So I picked this passage because it has a lot in there. But as you go through it, circle down some things, give you just a second, and then, uh, then we're going to just start talking about what we observed, okay? Go. I should be running.
All right, hopefully you guys have started to see some observations and things have started to pop off the page to you. And so let's let's hear what you got. If you're still writing, just keep writing. And as you hear other things, you might circle. Other people have said that's cool too. So what do you got? What are you seeing? Why so much emphasis on loving believers only and not Ah, it's a great one. Did anyone hear that? Why is there an emphasis on loving believers and not everyone else? It's a good one. It's really good. <clears throat> what else? The reference is children. Children. Okay. Good. What well, does that weird toggling thing between friends and children, and then all of a sudden that throws in brothers and sisters? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's this language dialogue that's happening. That's good. What else? Don't be afraid. It's just observation, so it's not wrong. This is what you see. Uh, mostly references to God, a few times Father, a couple of Jesus, and then one Spirit at the end. Mm -hmm. That's good. Is that really self-contained? Mm -hmm. Because it makes references to stuff that it assumes that people know that are outside of this letter. Great. That's a great insight. You make a good report. <laughs> <laughs> So let's see, we're learning together, right? We're hearing what other people are seeing. Maybe we didn't think about that, and we're like, oh, yeah, okay, that's true. That's in there. So this is good. What other things? I had a question, too, about he says, anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. Really? Right. <laughs> right. 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 Exactly. True. There's a lot of absolutes. There's a lot of absolutes. Okay. Good. The part where he says, and we will receive from him whatever we ask. Yeah, how does that fit? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the things I noticed in there was um, how much he talks about the word no, and then he and then he correlates that with deceive and not understanding. So there's these, this juxtaposition of these two words. Repetition of the word belong in reference to Christ or the devil. Yes. Yes. Great. Say that again so everybody can hear you. Repetition of the word belong in reference to Christ or the devil. Belong. Good. These are all good words that you're writing, that you guys are saying. Good thoughts. What else? The whole passage just seems to be one side or another. Like everything is like the polar opposite. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Whether it's with the devil, against the devil, you're confident, yeah. you're not. Right. You're love, you sin. Like, yes. Contrasting again, right? Good. So we're so now we're, we're picking up themes, right? So we're seeing themes, recurring uh, words, actions, this juxtaposition of different things. That's good. <coughs> good, good. More, more contrast. <coughs> so typically, when you would do um, sit down, you take a passage, you would read this, and you typically go four or five times through this, just observing. Just observing. So read it again, read it again, read it again. And, and sometimes it's helpful to read in different translations, and then you might get different things out of it, which is also helpful. Uh, if you have certain apps, they'll read the Bible to you, which is also helpful because it was meant to be listened to, right? So I think those are helpful ways to hear different things that you might not catch if you're reading it yourself. So that's helpful as well. What else? Any other last thoughts? Well, I can see where uh, you, certain parts of this you could take it out of context and just by itself, where it says murderers don't have eternal life within them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they're just saying, well, I'm done. 
That's the danger, right? Because people will grab stuff like that and pull it and go, this is the truth. And you go, whoa, whoa, where did that come from, right? Good. And then you read it there, right? Someone shows it to you and you go, oh, yeah, it does say that. But if you don't understand the context, right? I was confused by those who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Mm -hmm. What is the word purity referring to? Right. Why does he use that word, right? It's not repeated anywhere else, mm -hmm. but then it goes into the whole righteousness versus something. Good. Good. No, you're seeing correlations. There's connections, things that he's, he's doing. Any other last little thoughts? <coughs> Good. So what we've done is we've taken a passage, we've made some observations, we've started to ask some questions. We have questions, we're not sure why things are the way they are. I think um, we understand that it seems like there are some prerequisite knowledge that the writer assumes that the reader knows. Um, and that we're like, okay, we're just looking at this, we don't know where it fits into the whole thing. We have the luxury of knowing this is one chapter of a book that's more than one, right? This is a letter written, there's more than one letter here. So that's good. So then the next thing we're going to do is we would move to what we call like the interpretation phase, right? This is the one where uh, we get to actually use tools and resources and other people, scholars, who look at words and uh, grammar and genre. This is where all the other contextual stuff comes into play that's super important to make sure we don't take things like murderers don't inherit the kingdom of God, and then you know, how, do we, how do we understand what's being said and why it's being said? Because if we keep in mind that this was not written to us, it was written for us, it helps explain some of the things that we're seeing. So let's just take a look at the first one. So if you get that page, this is your cheater page that I got for you guys here. Um, what I've done is I've just compiled some different things. These resources can be available to anybody. Um, I just used some online stuff. I had some of my resource books, my Bible dictionaries from stuff from school that I just kind of put together. So this is kind of a hodgepodge of things, but things I thought would be beneficial for you guys to understand. So let's just, let's just look at the authorship thing at first. So who's the writer of this, right? So the author of uh, John is, is John of Zebedee. The apostle, the author of the gospel of John and Revelation. Why is that important? It's important because we can see, if we go back and look at other books that John, John's written, we'll be able to see themes, kind of the way that he writes. And if you understand the Gospel of John, it's so remarkably different than the other Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you can see very specific ways in which he writes, right? The way that he communicates, the things that he's saying. He writes in this, like, cryptic, he's painting pictures, he's telling these stories. That's important, right? Um, he was a fisherman, one of Jesus' inner circle, together with James and Peter, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is hilarious that he wrote that about himself, right? <laughs> um, he may have been the first cousin of Jesus. Uh, his mother may have been Salome, possibly a sister of Mary. This view assumes that his mother's sister, in John 19.25, refers to Salome. Some further assume that Mary, the wife of Clopas, there stands in opposition to his mother's sister, which would mean that this Mary and Salome were one and the same person. So they're just giving you a little bit of reference. Uh, uh, it's not necessarily hugely debated about who is the author of this letter. Uh, it came back up in the 20th century recently. People started to, to wonder, was it really John? Um, but I think uh, text criticisms and everything have shown that John is actually the author. So unlike most New Testament letters, 1 John does not tell us who his author is. Uh, that's important to know. This earliest identification of him comes from the church fathers, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Origen. All designated the writers as the Apostle John, as far as we know, no one else was suggested by the early church. The style of this letter closely resembles that of John's Gospel, especially when we allow for the differences of genre, subject, and possibly more a specific audience for the letter, which is something you guys already picked up on, right? You already were seeing that there was something specific, there was an agenda, there was a reason why he's writing this. The next one is super important, is genre. Uh, genre... Uh, it says, because most of the first John, except for 2, 12 through 14, reads more like a homily than a letter, it might be classified as a letter essay. Does anybody know what a homily is? A sermon, right? So that's important. Why is that important when you look at the genre of this letter? Because what we understand about homily, about sermons, is they're not necessarily doctrinal, right? It wasn't meant to be a doctrinal statement. He wasn't making statements that someone could pull and begin to build doctrine of. But this is what people do, right? You read something out of context, and people will start to pull text 
and make it something that it wasn't intended to be. It's why you have to understand genre. A perfect example of this is you remember, if, for those of you who've been with Vox for a while, I taught on the passage of Jonah. Do you remember that? And, and people I get hung up on the whole Jonah story about this whale swallowing a person and is it possible when they didn't realize the genre is actually parody, right? And so he's actually telling a story. It's, it's a fanciful story. It's a narrative tool, a way to tell people about the, 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 the deception that happens when you are racist or when you're xenophobic and what happens to you, right? So it's important to understand what's happening because these literary tools are important. These writers were smart. They had an audience, they knew what they were trying to say, and they understood their culture. So they're using tools to do that. So keep that in mind. This is a sermon. This is an essay written to a specific people. So now we're gaining more context, more understanding, right? The date. The letter, is difficult, the letter is difficult to date with precision, but factors such as evidence from early Christian writers. Um, number two, the early form of Gnosticism. Anybody heard this word before? Gnosticism, what is that? Reflected in the denunciations of the letters. Three, indications of advanced age of John suggest the end of the first century. Since the author of 1 John seems to build on concepts and themes found in the fourth gospel, it's reasonable to date the letter somewhere between 85 and 95 after the writing of the gospel, which may have been written in 85. Dates are important, right? Dates are important because um, I encountered this when I taught uh, a while back at Vox. Um, I was speaking, I think, out of, uh, maybe it was Acts. Um, we tend to read those passages as if they're happening in real time. Right? Like the author is just writing down the things that are happening in real time and then it's compiled and now we're just reading it. But what we don't realize is that these guys have had lots of time to reflect on what they've seen and what they've heard. And so they're retelling stories some 10, 15, 20 years down the road with perspective. So that changes the way we understand the text and how it's written. Um, let's see, let's go to background. Because the audience of John's gospel may include Jewish believers expelled from their synagogues. This is hugely important, right? This is going to really tell us about some of the stuff that's being written in here and why it's being written. So a lot of the questions you guys were having is going to be answered in some of these things here. Because the audience of John's gospel may include Jewish believers expelled from their synagogues, it is possible that 1 John at least partly addresses churches where some members have returned to the synagogue by denying Jesus' messiahship. I put the notes in there, and if you want to go to the other passages, you can see this. This was only one of the problems John addressed in the churches of Asia Minor. However, it was relevant in Smyrna and Philadelphia, but in some locations, the primary issue was uh, comprised with idolatry uh, advocated by false prophets. Another problem in some churches was that the church needed more love. That's not true today. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly including love for one another. So someone had a question, why is it talking about just believers so much? Certainly false prophets, uh, false apostles, and teaching abound. Any of these issues or combinations of these issues could lie in partly in the background. Now, it's important to, uh, as a reporter, uh, someone who's looking at the text, making observations about what's happening, is to now sort of begin to transport yourself back in time. What did it mean to be a Jew at that time? I mean, this is a huge cultural, societal um, huge ramifications, right? Like, I mean, everything is wrapped up into that. Everything is tied to that. And so, to separate yourself from your Jewish heritage, to say, I'm no longer a Jew, I'm a follower of the way, you can see how people can become ostracized, right? I mean, this is a, a, a big deal. So, it's a little bit different than saying, like, I'm no longer a Calvary person, I'm now a Vox person, right? That's a little different. These, these are huge implications. Now, some of those things might still be true. You might have some ostracization of people, and that happens, it's unfortunate. But understand there are great ramifications, and so to address them in the letter is important to know, oh, he, this is a big deal in this time. So, Gnosticism, this is a good one. So, obviously Gnosticism is huge uh, in the first century. Uh, you want to go and do studies on it, I, go for it. And you'll, when you start to understand Gnosticism, you see a lot of the writings of Paul and they're addressing this issue specifically. They're writing against some of those things. So, one group, Docetus, believed that Christ was divine, but only seemed to become human, right? So, he wasn't actually uh, flesh and spirit. He was, he was just kind of seen to have that appearance, so that's their belief. Another group, followers of one, uh, Serenthus, believed that the Christ spirit merely came on Jesus, but they denied that he was actually the one and only Christ. Some Gnostics believed that they were incapable of committing real sins, 
although their bodies could engage in behavior that non-Gnostic Christians considered sinful. This is important because when you go and read something like uh, Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, um, one of the things that he addresses is that people were having sex with temple prostitutes. A bizarre thing, right? Why would somebody do that? How could somebody who's religious be in a church be having sex with temple prostitutes? Again, if you thought that your flesh was separate than your spirit, this was a way that you could do whatever you wanted and say, oh, I, that's just my flesh. It's not my spirit. My spirit is separate from that, right? So you see why he's addressing these issues. Um, what, whatever, uh, whatever the specific background we reconstruct, one point is beyond dispute. The primary troublemakers are clearly cessationists, people who had been part of the Christian community John addresses, who had rejected the teaching of that community. John advocates testing the spirits by two main criteria, a moral ethical test, keeping the commandments, especially love of the Christian community, and a faith test, the right view about Jesus. So, let's think back to some of the observations, some of the questions that we had, right? Why is there this juxtaposition? Why is he comparing and contrasting? Why is he going after these things, right? Is it all starting to kind of make sense a little bit more now? Um, now, as you go back and read it again, I'm going to have you read it again. I put some key words there. So, obviously, the whole entire text, the Septuagint, is all Greek, right? So it's been translated. I'm not going to go through every one of those words. But there's some words in there that popped up, like love. Um, I, I thought it was important for you to understand how that word is being used, because uh, love has a lot of different definitions and meanings throughout Scripture and the text that it's used. But here, it's used in this word, agapau. Agapau is the word that it's used. It's a verb, and you can read some of that information there. Uh, the next one is evil one, right? So you've seen the evil one or devil, I think is what it says in there. It might say in there. Uh, what does that mean? Um, it's easy to just make it the cloven hooked guy who lives down in the fiery pits of hell, right? Uh, but if you read the definition, it doesn't actually mean that, right? And so some of the translations don't do it justice, and so it's important to understand the meaning and the nature of the word, right? So why don't we do this? So take a couple more minutes and read through again, now with this information in hand. And you can go back and look at the, the background information, the authorship. Start to begin to interpret why some of those things might be said. Why he's saying the things he's saying. Why he's writing this. Now you're going to make some, maybe assumptions or some guesses with a little bit more context. Okay. So take a few minutes, read through that again, and then let's see if we can make some of the connections. Sound good? All right, go for it. So I know we're short on time, so I'm rushing here. Um, let me ask a question, and then we'll, we'll, this will help kind of dive into the more. Why the emphasis on loving simply believers? What do, you, what do you think? Just off the top, kind of, we're here in the background. Do we have some more conclusions about that? Why? There's conflict in the community. Conflict in the community, as we said. What else? been ostracized from their entire way of being, and this was their new place of belonging. You would have to sort of recreate that social structure for one another. Yes. Absolutely. You hear what you said? You've been ostracized from your community, now you're into this new community. 
how great would that be to show you what this kind of love looks like, right? A new love. And you'd have to have a secure sense, a secure place that you were accepted and loved and cared for. That's good. What else? If the if I'm looking at the translation for the keyword love in this context is God's attitude towards his son and it, it would only be understood by someone who was a believer to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know, so in this context the emphasis is on that God and the Son, and if you had an unbeliever they wouldn't be there yet. Right. Yeah. That's good. That's, that's right. Good observation. One of the things I should probably point out uh, with Gnosticism, which I didn't put in here, I have to think about it now. So Gnosticism comes from the, uh, the Greek word gnosko, which is to know. And Gnostics believed they had a special knowledge. They knew something special that other people didn't get. They had something that, that they acquired that other people hadn't quite got. So with that in mind, it, you start to see why he says that you should know, right? What does it mean to know? How many times does he use the word know? He says, God's children because they don't know, but then he says, but we do know, and then he goes on, that they do not know him or understand who he is, do not have anyone to deceive you, and you know that, and he, he uses it over and over again, right? Because he's trying to contrast the Gnostic uh, way of thinking in his community, right? What else? Any other thoughts? There's a little more clarity for me in terms of that question I had earlier. Anyone that you should live in him will not sin. Uh, it's kind of maybe more of a larger contrast. And you know, you're not going to be going to the temple prostitutes. You know, it's these kinds of things, right? right. These larger, right? Sort of deal. Probably. Right. And that would be a good one for you to go and take that word sin, find some tools, figure out the Greek words being used there. It's probably hamartia. What does that mean? And how does it mean in this context, right? Because it doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means all the time. So that's important. It's good. Uh, uh. But the people will take that, right? And they'll go, well, you're sinning, so you're not in Christ. You want someone back there? Go ahead, John. Um, at the very last, he says, and this is his commandment. Uh, this is he commanded us. So it sort of puts an imperative in all this, where it's more than just my opinion. This is a commandment of Jesus. I, so he sort of puts a finality and, and an authority on, on, on the very end there. Yeah. Exactly. One of the things that you mentioned earlier was the uh, prerequisite knowledge, right? Um, it's important to understand that this letter was written after the Gospel of John. So to John's listeners and readers and hearers, they would have had the prerequisite knowledge of John, say John 3.16, for instance, right? Um, so when he talks about sin, he's talking in reference to the same sin that he talks about in John. So you bring some of those things into uh, the context of what he's saying here, and it makes more sense, right? And so these letters... Uh, they would have circulated through lots of different churches. They would have been read to different people. They would have understood, and, and that's true. Like, um, if you read, uh, I don't know, I don't know who a, an author is that has multiple things, like a Harry Potter book. It's all written in the same style, right? It's all written the same way, and so you understand when you're reading something who is writing this thing. And these first-century people would have understood. Oh, this is John writing, right? Sometimes they had people who imitated the, the the original authors, and they would write for them. That's that's something that happened as well. Um, but understanding a couple things, and this is, a, this is meant to be a message, he's preaching, this isn't meant to be something that's doctrinal. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not doctrine in it, but it's not meant for us to take things and start to build doctrine out of it, right? So that's important. Okay, I get the wrap-up sign, so we're, we're here. Um, this has been, for me, the easiest message ever, because I didn't do anything, you did it, right? And so I think it's good, right? Hopefully you feel empowered, encouraged, and like, I could do this. This is not something that is like crazy. Um, the tools are available for you. They're, they're, they're there. Um, I can give you lots of different references of things that are good to pick up. And, you know, it's like you just read lots of different things and you begin to get some different ideas and thoughts. And in the vast world of theology, man, it's, it's so... Not everybody agrees on everything. That's okay. You don't all have to agree on the same thing. You can have different thoughts about something, and that's okay, right? So hopefully you feel empowered. Um, hopefully you feel you gained a little bit. This is why, too, Bible study in groups like this is huge. Because people come up with things that you can't think of, and you come up with things that they didn't think of. And so it helps us uh, look at the text differently. So this is something that you can do. I put on the back of there, if you're looking at that little thing at the bottom, uh, observation, interpretation, correlation, navigation. It's called the OICA method is what we use. Um, very, very simple way of doing it. There's lots of different other ways that you can 
do it. This is one way that you can do a simple study of a text together with some other people or by yourself if you want to. So, thank you again for letting me be here. Let's uh, let's pray and then uh, we'll I'll, we'll start uh, the Eucharist. Um, God, thank you for today. Thank you for this group of eager people who want to learn and who want to truly understand your word and your will and your desire for them, not just in their own life, but in a sense of uh, the community that they're in. Community here, but also the community at large. Uh, we pray that you would speak life into all the different things that this community is, is, is thinking about, is praying about, is excited for. Uh, we pray that you would just bring a sense of, uh, of peace and uh, excitement about the future. We're thankful for your son Jesus that gives us the way to live a life unlike any other person in history. Help us to be more like Jesus. Help us to walk more in his way, in his shadow. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.